Hi guys, Mr. Dunbrook again, coming to you live in uh, 4K Ultra HD 5G from my basement. Um, today we're going to tackle Chapter 11, Part 2 of the PowerPoint. Um, I'm going to go through some of these slides kind of quickly because you guys are used to this stuff, and then near the end of it we'll spend a little bit more time as it will uh, get you ready for your next assignment. Um, actually, the next couple of assignments. So, um, if you remember last time in chapter one, or sorry, in chapter 11, part one, we got through the first 25 slides. So, I'm going to scroll all the way down to slide 25 or 26. Um, this would be a good time for you to pause the video, make sure you have your PowerPoint with you, and something to write with, and a highlighter, and, and so on. Okay? All right, I'm going to shut the camera off. I hope you guys are all doing well. I miss you. Um, this stinks, obviously, but we're getting through it. And um, we'll, we'll see each other someday. I don't know when that's going to be, but we're going to see each other again. So keep that in mind. Stay positive. Stay strong. Stay healthy. All right? Okay. So I'm going uh, to disable the camera, but I'm going to still keep talking over the video. Okay? All right. So I'm going to scroll all the way down to chapter, I'm sorry, to slide number 25. I just passed it. So, <clears throat> excuse me. Slide 25 was right about here. We were talking about genes, and I already messed up, huh? Do that one more time. Slide 25. Sorry. This mouse pad is not very forgiving, so there we go. All right, so as we said, genes are really just sections on your chromosomes that give you instructions for traits. And if you remember, um, humans, for example, get 46 chromosomes, 23 from mom and 23 from dad. But a better way to say that is we get 23 pairs. We get two chromosome number ones, two chromosome number twos, two chromosome number threes, and so on. One from mom, one from dad. Now, when we go to make sperm or egg cells, and this is true of anything that reproduces sexually, not just children, I'm sorry, not just humans, but when we go to make sex cells, remember, we don't put all 23 pairs in, we put 23 singles in, as far as chromosomes go. Again, think of chromosomes as chapters, and think of genes as pages on those chapters. Let's see if I can uh, highlight some of this focus for you. So think of these as pages on this chapter. This is only one chromosome here. Now notice it's got two sister chromatids because it's getting ready to copy. Don't worry so much about that, but I'll just keep in mind, gene is to chromosome as page is to chapter. And of course, all your chapters make up your entire genetic book. Okay, so scrolling on down here. Today, we call uh, different versions of genes alleles. Again, think of these as varieties or flavors. There are at least two alleles, at least two alleles for each trait, at least two. Uh, one allele comes from the male sex cell and the other comes from the female sex cell. You guys actually saw this when you did the meiosis cards and you saw that you started off with a diploid cell and you uh, produced four haploid sex cells or gametes and you saw the way that that worked as far as you getting one of each colored chromosome in that activity and not getting both of each color because that would make a diploid sex cell and that wouldn't work if our sex cells were diploid meaning had 100 percent of our dna then when a sperm and an egg joined together that baby would start with 200 percent of the dna and that would not work okay and this goes down to talk a little bit more about mendel's experiments um, what I'm saying with humans, again, still applies, or what Mendel did with pea plants still applies to humans. Don't forget that, please. Um, and, of course, if you are a purebred, you are homozygous, either dominant or recessive. You have two of the same thing, uh, two of the same alleles. We would say that that is uh, purebred or true breed for that trait. If you have one of each allele, in other words, if you're heterozygous, you would be considered a um, a hybrid, not uh, not a purebred. But again, remember, if you are homozygous dominant or recessive, we would still say that that is true breeding or purebred. Okay. Um, we talked about this in the last part of the PowerPoint. Mendel was kind of surprised by some of his results, like when he crossed tall pea plants together. Um, sorry, when he crossed tall pea plants with short pea plants and in the first generation, he got all tall plants. This started him wondering about things. And after he collected much, much, much data through his observations of his pea plants being born, he started to come up with a system that said, well, each pea plant must be getting one allele from each parent. They didn't know that at the time. 
He did not know that yet. So he was the one figuring this out. And he noticed that um, the way these babies were born and the ratios that he saw in the in the babies or the offspring, he was, was calculating backwards from these numbers, like seeing three to one ratios or two to two ratios. Uh, he was calculating backwards, and that's how he figured out that there must be this business of one allele from each parent and this also this business of some alleles must be more dominant over uh, other alleles, which he called more recessive, okay? And, of course, we use capital letters for dominant and small letters for recessive. You guys already know all that stuff, all right? So, so when setting up Punnett squares, remember, these would be the uh, alleles from the dad's gametes, the sperm, or the sperm cell in this case. Notice they only have one allele, 50% of what the dad got. The dad has both of these in his body cells, because his body cells are diploid, but he's only going to put half of them in one sperm cell and half of them in, in a, another sperm cell. Or a better way to say that, 50% of his sperm would get this A, and 50% of the sperm would get this other capital A, this dominant trait. Uh, for mom, this was the same thing. Mom herself is diploid. She has both of these in her body cells, but when she goes to make an egg cell, she only puts 50% um, of her small A's in, in, into half of her eggs, and the other small A goes into the other half of her eggs. Um, this is a very simplified version, okay? Now, when we do the Punnett squares, remember, if we take these parents, we are uh, predicting what the children should be. This is not always the same as reality. Keep that in mind. Um, as we go through these punnets, um, try to look for patterns in the ratios and the type of genotypes and phenotypes that you're seeing for the kids that would be predicted based on what the original parents were. That's the secret, and that's what Mendel did a really good job of, is looking at ratios. Um, also, please keep in mind, you cannot always tell a genotype um, from looking at a phenotype. For instance, uh, if you look at brown-eyed people, they might be big B, big B, or they might be big B, little B. You don't know. However, if you look at a blue-eyed kid, um, their phenotype is blue, and you're sure that they're little B, little B, their genotype is little B, little B, because that's the only way you can be blue. Um, so keep in mind, Mendel really was looking at phenotypes, what he could see and observe, not necessarily all genotypes, okay? And again, this is just how we do the punnets. You guys are already familiar with this. Um, gametes or sex cells on the outside here, and children as a combination of those gametes in the boxes, okay? More uh, vocabulary. If you, go, if you don't know the difference of genotype and phenotype yet, um, you're behind the ball and you better get, get on it, all right? Okay. Uh, again, homozygous versus heterozygous. You guys should all know these terms by now. Um, anything with two of the same alleles here and here, we would consider to be homozygous. This guy would be homozygous dominant. This guy would be homozygous recessive. Anything we call heterozygous would not have two of the same alleles. It would have one of each allele. So heterozygous hybrid. Okay. Probability, the likelihood that an outcome will occur or an event will, will happen. Um, flip a coin 100 times, you would predict through probability that you would get 100, I'm sorry, 50 heads and 50 tails. However, that might not be the case. You might get 80 heads and 20 tails. Um, but if you do it enough, if you flip enough coins, as you do more and more and more uh, sampling of this, is what we call sampling, you will see that it, it, the reality starts to really closely match the probability that you would expect. The more coins you flip, the closer to 50-50 you're going to get. Okay. Um, by the way, if you're watching um, any of the information on coronavirus right now, with how they're modeling predictability and the statistical predictions of how the virus is going to spread. A lot of that is, is related to this probability business. Okay. Um, very interesting, by the way. Uh, we already talked about this. Mendel figured that two alleles are separated during the formation of gametes. You saw this when you did your meiosis cards and you put them in the sequence on the counters and on your desks that you worked with when you had those 17 cards that we put in order. Okay. Um, remember, an organism that is reproducing sexually only gives 50% of its chromosomes to its sperm or eggs. Mendel called this business of splitting up your, your alleles or genes into your uh, gametes at, in making only 50% um, or making these gametes haploid, he called this business segregation. In other words, you segregate your chromosomes 50% into uh, your sex cells or your gametes. You segregate your chromosomes. 
Uh, this is just kind of an example of looking at what we call a dihybrid cross. Where we're looking at two traits. We're looking at flower um, color and also we're looking at kind of the consistency or the shape of the flowers as well. Don't worry about that slide. We're going to skip over this because this has already been done. Um, you know, just looking at what ratios we got. What, you know, we talked about how in his F1 generation with tall plants, everything came out tall. And then in the F2 generation, he got about one fourth of the plants to be short. Uh, we said this was a skipping a generation. And the reason for that was because that little T hooked back up with another little T in the F2 generation to, cr uh, to create one short plant. And again, that was in a three to one ratio, okay? And if you look at the probability of this stuff, it's pretty easy to calculate probability. You just take whatever the chances are of one thing happening, times the chances of another thing happening, and you'll get the predicted uh, probability of what the combination of those two things would be. So um, if you look at half of uh, the big T's and half of the little T's and you times those together, one half times one half is one fourth. So the chances that you would get two little T's hooking up would be one out of four or a three to one ratio. That's the same thing. And again, that's all review. Uh, so here now we're going to shift gears a little bit. We're going to talk about does inheriting one trait necessarily mean that you have to inherit another trait? For instance, if you have blonde hair, do you always get blue eyes? Or if you have red hair, do you always have freckles? And the answer to this question is it depends. Sometimes you will inherit traits together. If you get one, you get the other, like a package deal. However, sometimes they do not influence one another's inheritance. Um, if you think about these chapters and these pages we talked about, in other words, genes and chromosomes, if you inherit an entire chapter like we do from our parents, if you inherit the whole chromosome, whatever genes are on that chromosome are going to be inherited as a package deal. The only thing that could kind of um, change that is that business of crossing over. Again, you guys saw that in your meiosis cards when chromosomes can actually switch pieces with one another, which was very interesting, which adds even more to variety. All right, so if you read in your book, and I know you guys all did your 11.1 and 11.2 and 11.3 reading packets, you saw this business of what, what we call a dihybrid cross, where we're looking at two traits at one time to see if one affects the other. So in Mendel's first um, cross of a dihybrid, uh, what he did was he took true breeding plants. Again, those are going to be homozygous, not necessarily dominant, but homozygous. And he did it for uh, a seed shape and color. So big R, big R was round seeds and yellow color. And he, he crossed these with little r, little r, which were wrinkled seeds and they were green in color. So yellow and round, homozygous for both traits, crossed with or mated with wrinkled and green. And if you cross these two plants, what would you expect to get? Well, let's see what he got. Please pay attention. This is new information here, okay? In the original cross, here was his cross. Again, these were, were wrinkled and green. These were round and yellow. Look at how we made this Punnett square now. There has 16 possible children, okay? And instead of just two gametes, I'm sorry, instead of just two possible gametes across the top and side, we now have four. Here's why. We're looking at two traits at once. We're looking at color and whether it's wrinkled or round. So color and shape, I guess you could say, right? Well, if I'm RR, sorry, if I'm little r, little r, little y, little y, remember, I'm not going to put all of those into my sperm or egg cells. I'm only going to put 50%, all right? But not just any 50%. I have to have at least one big, or sorry, one r and one y. So to make the gametes for this dad, we'll call him, all of his gametes would actually be the same. They would all have an r and a y, r and a y, r and a y, all small letters, all recessive. For the mom over here, she was homozygous dominant. So all her eggs will have 50% of what her regular body cells have. In other words, this is diploid, but her gametes will be 50% haploid. That's the egg cells right there on the side, okay? So the possible eggs that mom can make are only really big R, big Y, because that's all she has to give because she was a true breed or purebred. So was dad, but in a different way. So now if you look, all the kids, when you combine these, um, so this sperm with this egg is going to give you this child, right? So that child would be heterozygous, 
but he would look like the mom. Notice he has one big R and one big Y, which is enough to give him that dominant round and yellow color. So in a cross between these two parents, remember dad was wrinkled in yellow, um, sorry, wrinkled in green, mom was round and yellow, all the kids actually look like the mom over here. I apologize if I said dad earlier, I can't remember. So they all look like the mom. Even though they're heterozygous, they still, their phenotype appears to be like the mom. Now that was the P generation. What Mendel did next was he took two of these kids, pick any two because they're all the same. And now he's gonna make these kids parents over here. Boom and boom. And now we're going to have the F2 generation. We're going to have the grandkids. So again, here was my P generation, this and this. These were my F1 generation. F1 generation is now going to become the parents over here to the F2 generation, the grandkids. Okay? All right, so now let's look, though. This is going to be a little different. If you look at this dad, big R, little r, big Y, little y. Well, he appears as wrinkled, I'm sorry, he appears round and yellow. So does the mom. She was the same. Okay, again, this was two kids pulled from over here. If you now look at the different gametes that these parents can form, they're different than in this other generation back here. They're different than these. For instance, again, this is diploid, but the sperm cells or pollen cells in this case from the dad are going to be haploid. The rule is you have to get one of the R's and you have to get one of the Y's in each sperm cell. Same true for the egg cells. One of the R's, one of the Y's. Diploid reduced down to haploid. That's what meiosis does when you make eggs and sperm cell. You reduce diploid down to haploid sex cells or gametes, okay? And so the different combinations of dad's pollen or sperm cells in this case could be big R, big Y, big R, little Y, little R, big Y, and little R, little Y. The same is true with mom, okay? So here we are in the F2 generation. And lo and behold, look what happens. You get all kinds of different looking kids. You get all different phenotypes. Going from round and yellow to round and green, to wrinkled and yellow, to wrinkled and green. There's actually four different phenotypes if you look in here, okay? And Mendel noticed this, and he started to look at the ratios or how many of each of those was occurring. And if you remember in your book, he found, as, he found a nine to three to three to one ratio, meaning, sorry, meaning he saw nine of these, uh, wrinkled, I'm sorry, round and yellow, nine round and yellow. Remember, that's round and yellow, that's round and yellow, that's round and yellow, that's round and yellow. Their genotypes are a little different, but their phenotypes are the same. So he found nine of those round and yellows when he did his actual experiments. He found three that were round and green. He found three that were wrinkled and yellow, these guys here, and he found only one that was wrinkled and green. Only one came out wrinkled and green. Uh, that's because that's a double, double recessive. You had to have all four recessive alleles to become wrinkled and green. So it makes sense that those would be less common. And again, nine to three to three to one ratio. This was a big deal because he started saying, okay, well, if you're round, I guess you're not necessarily yellow. And if you're Wrinkled, I guess you're not necessarily green, and so on and so forth, because he saw all possible phenotype combinations in his actual experiments. Remember, this is prediction, but what Mendel actually saw, he recorded uh, from looking at the plants in his greenhouse. Okay, <clears throat> so with this idea, the fact that he saw that having one gene doesn't necessarily mean you get the other gene, um, usually, he called this the principle of independent assortment. And it states that genes can segregate independently. In other words, uh, when he did the shape and the color in the pea plants, it didn't necessarily mean if you were yellow, you had to be round and so on, okay? So you saw different combinations. Again, this also adds to diversity, right? Gives us more variety. In other words, inheriting one gene does not necessarily affect the inheritance of another gene. Keep in mind, though, these genes must have been on different chromosomes. Otherwise, you would have inherited or the plants would have inherited them together.
Okay, moving on. Again, just another reminder that genes are parts of chromosomes. If I inherit the whole chromosome from my mom, which I'm going to do, we get these in, total, in packages called chromosomes, then any gene that's on there is going to be inherited as a package deal. You got the whole chapter, which means you get all the pages in that chapter. What can split pages apart in chapters? That process we looked at in the meiosis cards, again, crossing over, where chromosomes can actually uh, switch parts. So this gets kind of complicated. Um, here's an actual image of a, uh, a chromosome under an electron microscope. This happens to be an X and Y chromosome from a male, human male cell. All right. Uh, we did these in class already, these karyotypes. But keep in mind, this would be a chromosome collection for a normal human. Okay. And notice, this would be a diploid cell. This would not be a sex cell for a human being because if it was a sex cell, it would only have one of each chromosome number. This one clearly has a pair of number ones, a pair of number twos, a pair of number threes. That's why this is a diploid body cell. This is not a sperm or egg cell. It's not a gamete. If it was a gamete, you'd have only one number one, you'd have one number two, you'd have one number three. Whether it came from mom and dad or not would, would be determined by that independent assortment and segregation business that we, we discussed. But um, just looking at this, we know this is a normal karyotype for a human body cell diploid, okay? And again, here's one for a, a dog. Dogs have 78 chromosomes or with 39 pairs, okay? This is a normal dog. And we started talking about different species having different amounts of chromosomes just because you have more chromosomes does not necessarily make you more complex or more advanced or more successful because i don't know of any dogs that can do half the things that humans can do although i know some dogs are pretty smart so i don't know uh, but just typically speaking more chromosomes doesn't mean you're more advanced okay um, looking at a comparison of a chimp and a human's chromosomes, well, it makes sense that chimps are our, our closest living relatives, chimpanzees, and they have an extra pair of chromosomes, but they're very close to our number. Remember, our number is 46. Chimps have 48 total chromosomes. They actually have an extra pair of the number two there, okay? All right. If mistakes occur in meiosis, where we have chromosomes that didn't split apart correctly, Remember, we can get some um, sperm cells or egg cells with too many chromosomes. We can get some with too few chromosomes, and that's going to affect the baby. Uh, if you look, again, we talked about this in class, common meiosis mistake. In other words, either sex, uh, sex cells, either egg or sperm, had incorrect number of chromosomes because meiosis went wrong in the dad or in the mom. Um, you can often get... Uh, cells, baby cells that start the baby, the first cell of the baby, what we call the, the zygote, uh, will have an extra or maybe a missing chromosome. In the case of Down syndrome, very common mistake, this turns out to be an extra number 21 chromosome, which is why we call it trisomy 21. <coughs> Excuse me. So you can see that because this occurred in meiosis, either the dad's sperm or the mom's egg had an extra chromosome, the baby started off its first cell with an extra chromosome, meaning all the chromosomes, sorry, all the cells in that baby will have this problem because the error occurred so early in the formation, okay? Um, and again, this is kind of interesting because if you look at all Down syndrome kids, they always have the same symptoms. That the reason that's interesting is because that kind of tells us something about what information must be on chromosome 21. In other words, what pages must be in that book and what instructions must be in that book. All right. And again, you can recognize a Down syndrome kid. They're always the same because they always have the same problem. Chapter 21 has a extra copy, which messes up uh, the development. Um, we talked about some other Patau syndrome trisomies. Um, this is a trisomy 13, very, very devastating trisomy to have. Uh, don't forget, we could also have monosomies where we're missing chromosomes. Um, this is a typical Patau syndrome baby. I know that that's disturbing, but you can see it's a different set of symptoms than a trisomy 21 or Down syndrome kid would have. So it depends on what chromosome is, has the error that will determine your your symptoms, okay? We can also have chromosome abnormalities uh, in number um, in the sex chromosomes. Remember, XX is a boy, sorry, XX is a girl, XY is a boy. Well, wonder if we have extra 23rd pair chromosomes here. Remember, Down syndrome was an extra tw number 21. Patau syndrome was an extra number 13. Wonder if we have one of these chromosomes extra in the sex chromosome 
um, number there. Remember the 23rd pair is actually your sex chromosomes. If you're XX, your girl. If you're XY, your boy. Wonder if you're XXY though. Wonder if you got an extra X, maybe from the mom or maybe from the dad's sperm. We don't know where it came from, but something had an error in it. Well, that means that baby would be born with every single one of its cells having that third copy of the sex chromosomes. Remember, you should only have two of everything, okay? So what kind of symptoms would this have? Well, it makes sense that Klinefelter syndrome people are technically males because they have a Y chromosome, but because they have not only one X, but two Xs, they tend to have a lot of female tendencies, okay? And it just makes sense because that's the chapter that has the error. Here's a typical monosomy, and this is a monosomy of the sex chromosomes of the 23rd pair. And instead of having an extra, we're actually missing one, X blank. Notice that would mean he had 45 total chromosomes. That's one too few than normal. This is known as Turner syndrome, and this is technically a girl because it doesn't have a Y chromosome. It's only got an X. But um, it's a girl that has never, that will never develop into uh, a fully mature sexually reproducing woman. It's kind of like a, a girl before puberty and she's kind of stuck in that phase pretty much her whole life, okay? And again, that makes sense based on what we see in the, in the error, what, where the error was, okay? So uh, meiosis, we already talked about this right here, right? But when you did this in your cards, I gave you 17 different cards. You had to do all the phases and all that. But what we're looking at here is... When we separate chromosomes, so this would be my diploid cells, and these would be the gametes that these parents are making, okay? Does it always mean if you get one gene, you automatically get the other? So if you follow some of these little genes here, um, some are for brown eyes, some are for black hair, some are for blue eyes, some are for red hair. So here's what we're saying. If you get brown eyes, do you have to get red hair or something? Or if you get black hair, do you have to get blue eyes and so on? And the answer is, if they're on, if these genes are on different chromosomes, then you can get any combination there is that is possible. You can get any varieties possible. So you see, we can have brown eyes, black hair, blue eyes, red hair, brown eyes, red hair, and blue eyes, black hair. We can have any combination here, meaning that getting one gene does not determine or affect the prob probability of you getting another gene. There's all combinations combined. That is because for the genes we picked here, for hair and eyes, those genes are on different chromosomes. If they were both on the same chromosome, if you got brown eyes, for example, you would always get black hair. Or if you got blue eyes, you would always get red hair. But these genes are on different chromosomes. In other words, these pages are in different chapters. So we can get any combination possible. And that, again, adds to variety. Okay? Um... This is all stuff we've already talked about. Okay, you can read that to yourself, but I'm not going to read it all. We've already discussed it very, very thoroughly. Okay, same with this. Gametes are haploid. Body cells or somatic cells are diploid. And you know that gametes must have 50% and body cells must have 100%. And another way to sum that up, if you have two normal reproducing sexual beings, organisms, in this case humans, they would be diploid. However... When they make sex cells, their sex cells are haploid, 20, or sorry, 50% of the original um, DNA or the original amount of chromosomes. That's the same thing. So egg cells are going to have only one N, meaning one of each chromosome. Sperm cells are going to be one N, one of each chromosome. We call that haploid. When a sperm and an egg combine, in the process we call fertilization, this is the first cell of the baby right here, and now we're back up to 2N or two of each chromosome, in other words, diploid. Now we have 50% DNA from dad, 50% DNA from mom, put them together, and we're back up to 100% we call 2N or diploid. This would be the first cell of the baby called the zygote. Every other cell from the baby now will develop through mitosis. Remember, mitosis is just simple, basically cloning of the cells, right? Just simple, uh, very simple asexual reproduction. So you can see a mistake in this cell here is going to lead to a mistake in the trillions of cells that make up the baby because every cell from here is going to be a copy of this first cell. So if there's a mistake in the first cell, there's going to be, be a mistake in all trillion cells that make up the baby. The earlier the mistake, the more it's going to be widespread throughout the baby. Again, here's a look at meiosis again, right? We started off with a diploid cell, very simple. Through the process of meiosis, we end up getting four 
haploid or 50% sex cells, either sperm or egg. If, these were, if this was a male, these would all grow tails and become sperm. If this is a female, one of these would become an egg, and believe it or not, the other three would kind of disintegrate. They don't, they don't um, survive, which is kind of crazy. So boys make sperm uh, at a four to one ratio that girls make eggs. All right, again, just showing Mendelian classic genetics, but everything we've been doing through these Mendelian genetics is the result of meiosis. You have to keep re referring back to meiosis. Why did Mendel see the things he saw? Because of meiosis, because of sexually reproducing organisms cutting the number of chromosomes in half when they produce sex cells so that when those sex cells recombine, you can get back up to a 100% baby. Okay, so this is just showing a germ cell is uh, it simply just a cell from a, a body. Uh, 2N it would be, in other words, diploid. And when we go through meiosis, we end up getting four haploid sperm or egg cells, okay? That's not the best graphic, I would say. I'm not going to go over all this stuff except for a couple of quick vocabulary words. Um, remember, in meiosis, you had to go up to go down, meaning you actually copy your chromosomes before you cut them in half twice. So you temporarily make what's called a tetrad, where you have really... 200% DNA, but then those cells get cut in half twice. So once down to 100 and another cut down to 50%. So you got to go up to go down because we're making four cells in meiosis, not just two like we did in mitosis. Um, so what can add to variety um, besides just reproducing sexually? You guys remember crossing over. Crossing over was when chromosomes during meiosis could actually switch pieces. That would mean that Two number ones, for instance, might be able to cross over and switch pa pages or switch genes or two number two chromosomes or two number threes. What cannot happen is a chromosome, uh, let's say a number two chromosome, cannot switch with, let's say, a number five chromosomes. They must be the same chapter number. We call those homologous chromosomes. Homologous chromosomes. Homo means same. So you're not going to switch a chapter 6 with a chapter 9 or something, okay? All right, and notice you're looking at this homologous pair here. They are not doubled up yet because they haven't really copied to, to reproduce or really to, to replicate, I should say. They haven't replicated yet. Um, you can see this is a typical chapter 11, maternal chapter 11, really chromosome 11, paternal chromosome number 11. So the one you got from dad, the one you got from mom. These can switch pieces. They can cross over and switch pieces, which adds to variety. Here's a maternal or mom chapter 17 or chromosome 17, really. Paternal chromosome 17. These could also switch pieces in crossing over. What cannot happen, though, is a 17 could not switch pieces with an 11. Just wouldn't work. Okay. I'm going to go quickly through this one here. This is all the same stuff. It's all just different diagrams of meiosis, so we're going quickly. Okay, so to wrap up this business of meiosis and, and genetics, I'm going to finish this PowerPoint. Instead of having to do a part three, we'll, uh, we'll wrap this up right now. Um, so keep in mind, again, um, we go, when we make sex cells, we go from a diploid body cell to four haploid sex cells or gametes. So uh, for the human example, again, normal human cells, all cells in our body have 46 chromosomes. That's like saying 46 chapters. Remember, a better way to say that is 23 pairs because we get one of each pair from mom and from one from dad, okay? We would say that's the diploid condition. As we go to make sex cells, as you saw in your meiosis activity with the, the sequencing cards, Here's my meiosis stuff, right? We go from a diploid parent cell or, or body cell of the parent, and that parent makes four haploid, 50% um, sex cells, gametes, uh, sperm and egg, all the same thing, right? 50% DNA. And for a human, we're going to stay with the human example here. A human cell, remember, 
right before meiosis actually occurs in, in prophase one of meiosis. Remember, meiosis is like a double mitosis. That's why we have prophase one and prophase two in meiosis. And we have metaphase one and metaphase two and so on. Um, a human cell actually would double its chromosomes up to 92 chromosomes. Now that's a little bit strange because you're thinking, well, we have to, we're supposed to cut 46 in half down to 50%. Why would we go up to 92 to start the process? Why would we double the amount of chromosomes when we're trying to cut it in half? And again, the answer is, so why double to decrease? You got to go up to go down because we're not making two cells. We're making four cells. So by the time we double the chromosome number once, but then chop it in half twice, we're down to 50%. Okay. So again, for a human example, uh, at the end of meiosis one, we've made only two cells and they're back to regular diploid cells because we doubled up here. We cut in half once right here. So we're back down to really where we started. But now we're going to split those cells in half again. And again, at the end of meiosis two, after we divide these cells, we now get four cells, each with 50% of the chromosomes, 23 single chromosomes, not 23 pairs. So this is our end result. Uh, through meiosis, a cell with six chromosomes. So let's say this was something simpler. Um, I think, uh, I can't remember what has six chromosomes. Fruit flies, I believe, have eight chromosomes. But let's say we were a simpler organism. We had six chromosomes. Uh, we could make eight different, genetically different sex cells. That does not include crossing over. When, when chromosomes switch pieces through crossing over, that increases the variety so we could make even more different types of gametes. But going back to the human example, human cells with 46 chromosomes, we can make, any one person can make 8,388,000 and so different sperm or egg cells. Lots of variety. That does not include crossing over. When you talk about crossing over and the chromosomes are able to switch switch pieces with each other, that takes that 8 million number pretty much to infinity. So that is why you will never see brothers and sisters that are identical, except for in the case of identical twins, and that's because those only come from one sperm and one egg to start with. So you can see this whole sexual reproduction thing, even without crossing over, it gives us huge amounts of variety. Add in crossing over, and the variety goes through the roof. It's insane. And it's a good thing because, remember, variety is how we evolve. Variety lets us have different variety, uh, sorry, different traits, and those different traits may, may survive or um, be more fit in a uh, different environment. So if one is something kills one, it does not kill all. That's very important to remember. So back to this making gamete stuff, just another way to demonstrate this. Uh, if you, if you think about, oh, sorry about that. So again, when you think about the variety, um, in the human example, again, um, picture this as your, any diploid cell in a, a normal human being. This would obviously be a male because the 23rd pair is different. It's X and Y. When you go to make a sperm cell, when this individual goes to make a sperm cell, he's not going to put both copies in his sperm. He's going to put half of his sperm are going to have 50% uh, and the other half of his sperm are going to have the other 50%. Actually, that's a bad way to say that. Let me, let me correct that. Half of all of his sperm will have half of these chromosomes in them. There are many different ways to do that. There are over 8,300,000 different ways for this individual to make different sperm cells. If this was a female, it would be the same with her egg cells. Picture, uh, if this is chromosome one, pretend that this is the chromosome from mom, this is the chromosome from dad. Uh, this is the chromosome from mom, this is the chromosome from dad. This is the number three chromosome from mom, this is the number three chromosome from dad, and so on. The way you can divvy these up and kind of sort these out through independent assortment and segregation is 8,300,000 different ways, okay? And again, that does, not, that does not take into account crossing over where these guys can actually switch pieces. So the variety is, is incredible, which is a good thing. All right, another way to think about it if you're more of a puzzle visual kind of person. If you think about this these two puzzles as the chromosomes in any one of your regular body cells, your diploid somatic cells. 
picture these as the chapters you got from your mom. These are the chapters you got from your dad. Now, when you go to make a sperm or egg cell, you're only going to put 50% of those pieces into your sperm or egg. Imagine how many different ways there are to have this puzzle built from these two different puzzles. Incredible. Lots of variety. Okay. All right. Last topic here, and we're almost done. We've so far been talking about what we call simple dominance, where uh, it's either or. One thing's dominant, one thing's recessive. We've also only been talking about uh, traits with one gene that controls them. Um, one gene that may have, you know, two alleles. So for instance, uh, if we talked about tall versus short pea plants, there's one, one gene for height that has two alleles, either tall or short. Those are very simple ideas. Matter of fact, those are eighth grade ideas. But there are occasions when genes have more than two alleles. So think of more than just two flavors or alleles that are not dominant or recessive for a trait. So they're kind of co-equal or they're equal strengths to each other. There are also traits that are controlled by many genes, each with numerous alleles. So not only are we talking about many, many flavors, we're talking about two different genes, each with many flavors or varieties that can lead to a certain trait. This can get very, very complicated. Mendel did not deal with any of this stuff. This was after Mendel. So this is kind of post Mendelian genetic stuff after Mendel's work. He didn't realize all this. One example is polygenic traits. Uh, a trait that uh, is controlled by many genes, and each gene can have a couple different varieties or flavors or what we call alleles. For instance, the shape of your mouth, the position of your ears, those are controlled by more than one gene. And often these genes are on different chromosomes, so you can get a ton more variety with this. Let's have a look at some examples. Skin color, human skin color. Human skin color is what we call a polygenic trait. It is not controlled by one gene. It is controlled by a couple of, actually three different genes. And each of those genes have two different alleles or flavors. That's a lot of variety. So there's not simply um, black, white, and mixed. There's actually about seven different forms of skin color, seven different shades of skin color, all the way from zero, which will, is what we would call an albino who has no pigment in their skin, all the way up to very, very, very heavy amounts of the pigment we call melanin that would make this person very, very dark skinned. But you, you can see there's actually seven different grades or shades of skin color. And this is because there are three genes controlling skin color. Each gene has two alleles. So there's, uh, this is what we call like a tri-hybrid cross. Notice that there's three alleles in each gamete or sperm or egg cell down the sides here. And when we combine those together, the, the, this one right here, for instance, the very, very dark ones, this would be a uh, capital A, capital A, capital B, capital B, capital C, capital C. That would give you the most skin pigment and make you very, very dark. If you look at something like this, let's pick this number three right here. That's how, how light or dark skinned you would be, kind of medium. Well, this person here would have a capital A, in a capital A, a lowercase b, in a lowercase b, and a uppercase c, in a lowercase c. So that would produce a kind of a medium amount of pigment. And this goes on and on. You can check out these examples in your textbook as well. All right, so please just realize that things are sometimes not as simple as we've been talking about, and they're simply not, uh, they're also not as simple as you talked about in eighth grade when you did genetics. Um, so I'll let you read this on your own, but it really says what I just what I was just telling you. If you had all dominant alleles for skin color, you would be very, very dark because you would have the most amount of melanin in your skin, which is the pigment. If you had all lowercase, you would be basically an albino, which is no pigment. Um, you'd be very, very white, and even your eyes would be pink, and your hair would be blondish, whitish, Okay, uh, if you're somewhere in the middle of that, you would be medium. So, for example, a genotype with three dominant genes and three recessive alleles, so something like this, heterozygous for all those alleles, you'd have a medium amount of melanin, a medium amount of that pigment, which would give you, you know, a medium skin color, intermediate skin color. Um, this can get very, very complex. All right, last thing here. 
incomplete dominance, and we're going to talk about co-dominance as well, and we're done here, guys. Um, incomplete dominance, the heterozygous genotype is a mixture of both the dominant and the recessive alleles. Um, sometimes you'll see this as dominant and recessive. Sometimes you'll see this as uh, where they're both actually capitalized letters. So, for instance, are there times when we get a mixing or a medium type of uh, relationship between alleles? Yes. In this case, uh, look at the red flower crossed with a white flower. We actually get a pink. So it's almost like you blended two different ink colors together to get this pink. The way I remember remember incomplete dominance is I think about mixing ink. So ink complete dominance. Red ink with white ink gives me pink ink. Incomplete dominance. Uh, again, sometimes you will see this written with capital A, capital A here, and maybe capital W or something, capital W here. Um, sometimes they do not write capitals and smalls when we're talking about incomplete dominance because really the red and the white are equal strengths, which is why um, sometimes you'll see this as lowercase, sometimes you'll see this as both uppercase or and or with different letters. So you might have a big R, big R, and a big W, big W that gives you big R, big W, which we would call pink. If you're confused on that, there's a little activity we have coming up that will uh, shed some light on that. Don't worry if you're confused right now. But just think of a blending of inks. Lastly, the last thing here, there was supposed to be a picture of a zebra right here. I don't know what happened. But picture a zebra or maybe a Dalmatian dog. Um, that's an example of not incomplete dominance, but co-dominance. Codominance is when both alleles are completely expressed. They don't mix. It's not like black and white would make um, gray. It's like black and white would make black and white striped or black with white dots or white with black dots and so forth in a skin color or something. But there's other things like this too. Sometimes um, height and things like that could be a codominance, or not height, but um, uh, height could be incomplete dominance, but we have other traits that could also be co-dominant. Um, one of those is blood type, and we'll talk about that in our next activity. So um, to wrap up, it gets a little bit more complex than simple dominance. Um, you need to be ready for that in our next couple of activities. And please write a one-page summary on what you learned here in this part two PowerPoint, and we shall uh, then move on to chapter 12, DNA and RNA, okay? Um, one more thing, sorry, multiple alleles, blood type. Blood type is um, not only multiple alleles, but it's also co-dominant. That's why you see different types of um, blood here. Uh, multiple alleles, more than one allele uh, controls a trait. And blood type in humans is not only multiple alleles. You have more than two choices, A, B, and O. Um, you also have co-dominance, where one is not necessarily dominant over the other. For instance, if you look at, if you have an A blood type from mom, let's say she gave you an A blood type allele and dad gave you a B blood type allele, you would be type AB. That's co-dominant. So blood type in humans is actually not only multiple alleles, more than two alleles, but it's actually co-dominant, meaning one allele is not necessarily stronger than the other. Kind of interesting. All right. Have a great day, everybody. Stay safe. Stay healthy. Please put the summary uh, posted to the assignment on Google Classroom. Again, this is PowerPoint video number two summary assignment. Um, we will not do any more PowerPoint for this unit. We are done. Okay. Have a great day.